guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 187, featuring an interview with the father of computer role-playing games, Richard Garriott, also known, of course, as Lord British. This part of the interview, we talk about his new Kickstarter project, a Shroud of the Avatar. He's already met his uh, minimum funding goal of about a million dollars, uh, but there's still plenty of opportunity left for stretch goals, and I know you guys are going to want to get in there and get the box copy edition and the cloth maps and all of the fun stuff we associate with Ultima and Lord British. Now, uh, Richard has promised that this project will be just as big of a leap forward in terms of technology that his earlier Ultima games uh, delivered. Now, now he's uh, completely unfettered by publisher uh, restrictions, limitations, suggestions, and that sort of thing. Uh, so this has the potential, in my opinion, to uh, deliver on that promise and be something really, really special. So I wanted to have him on the show to tell us all about it. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Lord British. Hi, folks. I am here with the great Lord British, Richard Garriott. <laughs> if you don't know who this man is, then what the heck are you doing? Uh, go play yourself some Ultima. Some of the you, Richard, you're probably the the father of computer role playing games. I think that's fair to say. You know, it is funny that um, I've recently, you know, to try to you know, come up with items to show off during the Kickstarter, I've gone back into my own archive all the way back to. It even be the, the predecessors to Ultima, and uh, and the more I looked at them, the more I went, "Wow, I really do go back to literally the beginning." Uh, I believe the teletype role playing games I wrote, uh, you know, at the time, the only other related kind of games that existed were you know Zork and Adventure, uh, which are adventure games. Uh, but I think I I really did write what probably is the very first ever computer based role playing games, and uh, and I've had the luck, uh, uh, good fortune to you know get a chance to move that the word state of the art forward you know numerous times uh, down through the years. So you're writing games uh, well before a Calabeth's so my. That's exactly right. No, in fact, uh, oh, do I even have uh, some of them around here? I think I do. Uh, I think in a, in a little pile that I've got here uh, next to my desk, uh, you know, I have uh, literally this uh, notebook. Let's see where it's written on the side. This notebook that says D&D number one is full of 1,500 lines of basic code uh, that I wrote on a, on a teletype, you know, back when you had to put things in on, uh, on paper tape. Uh, you know, punch holes on paper tape, and and even the story that became Ultima One, uh, I wrote back in high school in my creative writing class. This is the story of Mondane, the evil wizard, and the good, the good uh, Lord British in the world of Cesaria. Uh, you know, and uh, and all of this. Uh, one of the rare times I made an A in English class. Uh, you know, was uh, writing the history of my D and D campaigns, which became the history of my computer games. I hope that those things are secure. <laughs> no, they're, gonna, they're right here gonna, beside me. So uh, uh, I literally keep them locked in a vault or something. Ordinarily? No, it's it's actually been. Uh, I've had to, you know, I'm a total pack rat collector. Um, so I've, I've thrown away no scrap of paper that I've ever written on that I'm a, that I'm aware of hardly. And uh, uh, so now I've been kind of tearing through it to go find all the you know parts and pieces that are that are uh, you know Im important uh, at least to me. <laughs> I don't think you're the only one that would like to, to hold those documents there. Yeah. Well, you've uh, titled this new Kickstarter is called A Shroud of the Avatar, Forsaken Virtues. And I think any fan of Ultima would recognize some of those references in the title. Sure. I was just wondering if you could explain uh, first what, what, what exactly is the new vision, uh, the reinvention, and, and will it have anything in common with the Ultima series? Yes. So um, uh, about a year ago when I really got started on the project myself, Know, sitting down to try to write some of the basic uh, principles, I actually published a little treatise uh, online called "What Is a Lord British Ultimate RPG," where I tried to kind of do a post mortem, you might think of it as, uh, of the Ultima series, in, from my perspective, as to what I thought were really the important advancements that I hope, as I go back into medieval fantasy again, that I want to carry forward into the new game. Um, so that I published about a year ago. So, so, so part of what Shroud of the Avatar is is an homage to some of the advancements that I think have, we've already gone through, some of which other games do, many of which, for some reason, no other developer seems to think they're important, so uh, they're still unique to games that I build. Uh, and then there's another part of Shroud of the Avatar, which is doing what I hope I have done a number of times in the past, which is 
you know, take uh, the great learning of uh, of all the successes and failures of other people's work in the role playing a- industry and go to the logical next step to continue to push the state of the art. So it, I'm hoping it is both appeals to people for their historical uh, uh, appreciation for what the Ultima series did, uh, and I think we're going to go beyond it. So and and to talk a little bit about both those sides, you know, first of all, it it is a story driven role-playing game a la Ultimas 4 through 7. Uh, there is a detailed story arc that, that, that carries you uh, as, as progress through the game. Uh, it is a deep virtual world akin uh, as much as anything to Ultima 7. It was sort of the, my, the touchstone that we're targeting uh, where everything you can see in the world that looks like it should interact, we hopefully will make it interactive. Um, and then uh, we're also making it uh, what, we, what we're finding. Of, we're still struggling for the right term, but the best term we found so far is selectively multiplayer. And uh, where you can really just throttle it up or down to effectively solo player, or, or even literally solo player, all the way up to what is really an MMO-like uh, experience, uh, but with a very different technological underpinning that we think will... Uh, uh, save uh, time, money, uh, and and also create a, a a more personally crafted experience for the player. So we think it's good for us and good for the player. Um, I'm not aware ahead. of any efforts to try something like that before. That was it, well. I can, it's interesting to, to see how it came about because um, you know, for me as a player, uh, I'm actually more of a gamer now than I have been in any other period of my time in, in my life, and so I'm actually particularly excited about this game. Not only because it is a chance to you know go back uh, and and go back into the field that I've kind of left behind a little while ago, um, but also because it literally is true that I I do more gaming now and in the sense of hours of play and games that a number of games that I play number of games I've completed uh, I do more now than in any other period of my life. That being said, at least half of it is at times when I'm not online, and so for me as an individual. As we started thinking about this new game, I really wanted to be able to play it when I wasn't connected to the server. And so even though we were immediately thinking of a... We, we knew we were going to do story-driven. We knew we were going to do multiplayer. But I said, look, I want to be able to play when I'm not connected, which means at least has to deal with effectively being solo player and offline for a period of time, which means that it can't just be client-server. The whole game has to be on my computer. Um, and uh, we started down this path of creating a game where... Um, you could, for periods of time, you know, like a day, be completely disconnected. And then when you would reconnect, it would update and validate all the things that you had done offline. But once we started down that path, we realized that would actually let you... It, it, opened, it opened the door to these other forms of, of play, like completely solo player offline forever for people who just want to play that way. And it turns out a lot of our fans, uh, a lot of the people who are already contributing to Kickstarter, you know, voice that they really want to make sure that that's an option. Um, some people I want it somewhere in the middle. Some people say I'm happy to be online and get the persistent world updates, but you know I really don't want to see a bunch of strangers who are just going to try to spam me with you know uh, abuse of one form or another. And there's another group of people saying, look, I really want the MMO experience. You know, I want to have the you know the most extreme folks. The, I want the fully open PvP. You know, whatever it might be, UO in its golden age. Uh, you know, that's what they're really looking for. And uh, and it turned out just by happens chance we were already in pursuit of a technology that would uh, facilitate uh, all of the above. Um, and while I think that most people will play in what I'll call the default setting, which is pretty open world, um, the point is people can turn it down to the level of comfort and safety uh, that they might prefer. You know, that seems even more relevant in the wake of uh, SimCity and all of the hardships they've had. Yeah. I don't think anybody's going to be in that position with Shroud of the Avatar. Yeah. Well, notice you've got uh, Tracy Hickman... Uh, on board as the lead story designer. I think it's safe uh, to say pretty much anybody who watches this show will be uh, familiar with uh, Tracy's work. Uh, in the video, I watched the uh, update video with him, and he's talking in there a lot about how the, uh, kind of what you said earlier, that you feel like, you know, the graphics and such have evolved, but not so much the, the gameplay. And it sounded like he was, he had some ideas about ways to integrate a the story into the gameplay, maybe in ways that hasn't been done before. I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Sure, and uh, uh, you know, if, let me kind of describe my opinion of um, uh, story and quests in role-playing games, and uh, where they've been okay, uh, and where they've been gone wrong. 
Um, you know, one of the things I really liked about some of the early Ultimas, which, by the way, I'm not suggesting this specifically because I don't think this would work in the modern era, but one thing I really liked about them was that if you received a hint, which was to go to the city of Trenzik, seek out the woman in the red dress, and ask her about pearls, it was completely up to you, A, to find Trenzik, B, remember that I'm supposed to look for a woman in a red dress, or hopefully it'll come back into my mind when I see a woman in a red dress. And then what was the exact word I was supposed to ask her? You actually had to write it down or, or remember it, or else it was, or all was for naught, and you'd have to go back and go shoot off to go back and find the original point of that clue again. Um, and while today I, I don't think that we can encourage people to go to that level of manual uh, dictation, uh, I don't think modern uh, people, uh, you know, modern youngsters, you know, or, or those middle-aged folks like ourselves, uh, you know, have the tolerance, uh, you know, for that. Uh, but I also don't like what it's become. If you go to the other extreme, you now go to most role-playing games, and you know, you land inside the virtual world, and it's a beautiful 3D world. But then suddenly, there's, you know, oh look, there's the person with the exclamation point over their head. That's who's going to give me my first quest. You click on them, you bring up a menu of options. Well, you basically just click on them all, except the ones that are stupid and clearly piss them off and run them away. But you click on all the obvious options until they're gone, and now whatever is relevant has been copied into my quest log. Now, I go to my quest log and I click on the first of whatever, how many quests I have, and an arrow shows up on the ground that drives me through the world to at least the general vicinity, if not the exact position of where my next step is. And I'm going like, wow, that is just not discovery. You've, it's completely lost the sense of of, uh, of uh, exploration and discovery. And so what we're really trying to do is, is bring back evolution and discovery. So we're not going to do, uh, at least our, our intention is, there's going to be no quest log. Uh, there's not the concept of, you are on a quest. Um, there only is the concept of, you know, uh, knowing, you know, deciding to do whatever it is you choose to do based on the information you've acquired through a variety of means in the game. Now, we probably will to prevent you from having to just write things down all the time. Uh, we are considering right now a, uh, you know, what I call a journal, to where basically all of your key accomplishments, etc., are you know, copied into a journal. So at least you can scroll back and go, now, what did that guy back in the other town tell me? And then scroll back, scroll back. Okay, that's what it was. And let me now go do this. But it still means you're largely entrusted with the strategy of what to do uh, based on your own mind. Um, and, uh, and the thing that I'm so excited about working with Tracy on is, you know, if I look back at the stories I told in previous Ultimas, and I think, you know, the best told Ultima stories were Ultima 4 through Ultima 7. And uh, Ultima 4, I think, was, uh, quote, brilliant, unquote, uh, because of just the idea, the idea of it. The idea to even, you know, start telling a story about virtue and uh, to have the game observe your behavior and make uh, judgments, uh, give you, give you uh, feedback later as to how it was interpreting your, your deeds and actions in the game. Uh, the, but Ultima 5 and 6 and 7 were much better told stories. And in particular, when I was working with Warren Spector as a producing partner on the game, I think the stories in Ultimas were their best. And it's because Warren is a much better writer and uh, student of storycraft Com compared to myself. I mean, I, I think I get the high points wet, done well, and I think I understand unfolding and staging it quite well. Um, but I think I do my best work when I'm working with a, a really good uh, story writer. And, um, and so that's what I'm so excited about working with Tracy. We've already worked together before on everything from little stuff like uh, killer breakfast at Gen Cons and Dragon Cons, you know, up through, uh, you know, he, uh, he and I wrote a script together that I uh, shot on the International Space Station on my space flight. Uh, and uh, so we've worked together on a number of creative projects, you know, down through the years. And we've been kind of looking for an opportunity to work together in games. And now's the time. Well, you say you're going to focus more on uh, player choices and discovery uh, rather than level grinding, which, you know, of course, we're all familiar with that concept. Uh, can you give me an example of the kind of player choice uh, that you have in mind? Yeah, and I think that um, Ultimus 4 and 5 are still the best touchstones for, for this. And um, in the prototype, you may see if you study the prototypes really carefully, which I know some of the players are doing, uh, looking at each screenshot to try to suss out you know, rules or uh, Im implications from there. But one of them is the gypsy encampment uh, that you stumble upon. And, and one of the youngsters in the encampment uh, is describing how these wolves are coming and 
He doesn't even say go go kill him off or dispatch him or run off. She just notices she just notes she's scared because the wolves are coming. It's up to you to actually go decide. Well, that might be a good time for me to go run these wolves off. And if you do, she's very thankful and she says, "Oh, thank you very much." You know, she says, "You know, I'd love to give you some a gift in return, but you know, we're just poor gypsies, and the only thing that I actually have that's of any value is is this is my wedding ring. But since you've saved my life, um, you know, I, I would love to give it to you. And you can take it or not. And the game makes no immediate." response to you is whether you do it just is remembering you know whether you think that that's reasonable to take something so precious for something which for you as the adventurer that you are was was uh you know not that big a piece of service um and so uh the, the and the point of it is that uh no one you know although there are occasions where even a single deed or action or response might have truly a branch in how the story unfolds for you um, the virtue system is really set out to watch your behavior, to just notice times when you're brave or honorable or to perform other deeds and actions that uh, uh, Im- imbue the qualities that the game uh, is monitoring and will later reflect to you uh, as to uh, you know, how others might interpret your behavior. I don't think you should take the wedding ring, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's funny is, I assumed that one was dead obvious. Uh, as I was as I was doing uh, press tours in in uh, California just before the Kickstarter, uh, we had uh, uh, I gave uh, the demo to uh, this this one woman that was last demo I did in California, and uh, and it, even before I asked, you know, what would you do? She saw the text come up and says, "Take it, pawn it, let's get going," and, and I was like. <laughs> Okay, we took the ring and off we go. And uh, but she's so far the only one. But it, like, literally, it was like there wasn't even any question to her. She she was literally just going, "I'm min maxing it. I'm not here to be virtuous. I'm here to min max my way to the top." And that's a perfectly valid way to play a game. May not be the best way to play this game, but it is a perfectly valid way to play a game. One one of the things that really has piqued my interest, uh, looking at the prototype and the, and the video, is this idea of a. A really fully interactive world, and of course I'm thinking of Ultima 7 there. Uh, there's a quote, if it looks usable, it should do something. Right. Uh, are you going to go beyond the, even the black gate level of interaction here? Well, uh, we'll see if we get beyond it. That was already a, uh, uh, oh, if you mean Ultima 9... Uh, uh, then, uh, uh, so, well, so Ultima 7 really is, I think, a, a pretty good target. I mean, if we get to the Ultima 7 level, I will be pretty happy as an individual, just because I think that was a, a very rich and detailed world. Um, and, and how, and kind of how I describe that to the team is I sit back, uh, you know, and well, in fact, let me tell you how it evolved and why I've become such a believer in this. You know, if you go back to the earliest Ultimas, you know, there was, there were only 16 tiles from which everything in the world was made. You know, there was grass and water and trees and the shape of a town and, you know, Lord British and you, the player character, and a generic NPC and a couple of monsters, and that was it. Everything in the world was one of those. And, uh, and then after a little while, the game, you know, the ne- each game I had basically twice as many tiles with which to make the game out of. And so eventually twice as many tiles meant not only could I make walls around the outside of a room and put either a difference between brick or wood on the interior of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the floor of the, of the room. Uh, but then uh, beyond that, uh, I began to be able to put some furniture in the spaces as well. And as soon as you put in furniture, you go, okay, plates and cups and bowls. Also, like a piano became one of those. I'm going like, well, you can't put a piano in without walking over to it, and you're, you're immediately attracted to it. You know, if, you, if there's a door, it's obvious you should open and close it. But it's less obvious that everything else should be interactive. And when there's only a few things, that's pretty easy. But the more and more detailed your world becomes, the more and more difficult staying true to that ideal is. And then beyond that, once you've put in things like the piano that's going to be played, you want to make sure that in at least one instance somewhere in the world, it's important to play the piano. And, uh, and that, for me, is actually what's fun as a designer, is you sit down and this now is your set of tools. You're just not, you know, now you're sitting going, like, okay, well, I know what the big plot items are. You know, there's the bad guy, here's the good guy, here's the, 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 you know, the three principal magic items, whatever they might be. But then when you get down to the subtlety of each individual person and what's important to each member of the NPC community, you can begin to craft around all these other interactive objects. And, uh, and at least for me, it's a, it's a great process of, of uh, creative joy 
uh, to go through that. It does sound like he has some really big plans for the crafting system. Uh, I know it's going to be a lot more involved than just clicking a button and watching the same animation over and over again. Not the, <laughs> oh, yeah. not the name of the name, so you know what game I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, can you compare what you have in mind, uh, your crafting system, with those that we might be familiar with from uh, games like uh, World of Warcraft? Sure, and um, uh, and so by the way, this is a system that is complex enough that um, you know what I'm going to describe to you is sort of our intention, um, but uh, there's reasonable odds that uh, will vary uh, significantly from the outline I'm about to give. But the the the, the basis, the first kind of fundamental underpinning of crafting, uh, uh, will go back to uh, something that uh, I've often referred to as a recipe system, meaning when you think of a recipe, um, the recipe in the game will include things like what equipment needs to be nearby. Those need to be, for example, a forge. What tools must you need to have personally? Tongs or a hammer. Um, what uh, skill must you ha already have? This requires blacksmithery level three, whatever it might be. Um, what consumables will be utilized in this recipe? You know, five ingots of ore, whatever it might be. So start with that as a basis. Um, but that is what I'll call the most simple form of any uh, crafting activity. What we're now trying to layer on top of that, and the, this is why the precise details of how this plays out is not yet known, is, uh, you know, I'm actually a big fan of um, uh, the crafting in Minecraft, where you actually, you know, sit down and logically and think of, you know, put stuff in a bowl, so to speak, or a little, little grid to, uh, to do crafting. And the reason why I use that as a uh, hypothetical target in comparison to, there are games which do mini games around every single sign of kind of cooking. You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do every type of type of uh, skill, uh, you know, the cooking one is slice up carrots, throw them in a bowl, slice up onions, throw them in a bowl, put them on the stove, etc. But that requires a huge, huge, huge devotion to custom coding per each crafting skill. And while there's some of my team is hoping we can push all the way to that extreme, I at least think for the first time out of the shoot, we might try to think of something that is more of what I'll call general purpose to all types of craft crafting. Uh, that uh, that I think Minecraft represents a good uh, hypothetical uh, target. So if I knock an acorn out of a tree, will I be able to come back years later and find a new tree where that one fell? Uh, that's a good question. No one has posed. No one has. No one on the team has suggested that one specifically. But uh, because we uh, uh, do plan, um, uh, you know, on having. Uh, uh, you know, player activity in and around their house to be persistent to the rest of the world, including, you know, uh, the, the kind of two of the main, um, you know, we, we, we have the, what I'll call the fundamental combat skills and the fundamental uh, completely non-combat uh, skills. Uh, you know, uh, if you think of combat, uh, there's, well, combat and magic and in the, in the subcategories of combat, you know, the ranged weapon and melee uh, uh, combat. And think of magic, it could split up into healing related or attack related. If you go back to uh, the non-combat professions, um, we want to make sure they always make little loops of, uh, of economic relevance. And uh, so blacksmithing was, of course, probably the most interesting and valuable one out of Ultima Online. And, um, uh, and so, therefore, the way you make a complete loop out of it is you include things like mining so that people can bring back the raw materials to the blacksmiths who can create nice weapons, who can then sell those weapons back to the people who need to go out to the mines to uh, you know, mine it. And so it makes a nice little loop. Similarly, you can imagine somebody growing food and cooking it to sell to the adventurers who also need to go out and you know, uh, harvest some more, bring back some more ingredients. So those are, at least those will exist. And to, the reason why I meant that is important for your acorn is uh, it, it is possible. Nobody's mentioned acorns before, but it is quite possible that, yes, you could go out in the woods and harvest an acorn or jack the giant bean stalk beans, who knows, and, uh, and grow them in your little plot out in the back of your house and grow yourself an oak tree. Well, no, you're, you've always considered packaging. Uh, manuals, maps, uh, trinkets, and all these things is really a key part of the ultimate experience. Yeah. I have uh, two questions uh, related to that. Uh, one, do you still think these things are as important now as they were back in the in the 80s, let's say? And uh, two, uh, why didn't you offer uh, the boxed edition from the outset? Um, well, so, uh, so, so yes, I, uh, I'm clearly a big fan of those items. And and for me, making the reality of the world as full as possible as, you know, uh, from the moment you experience and handle the product, uh, the better. Um, and so 
So I knew even before we started, one of the first pieces of canon, I, I, have, a, I, in a, I have a Dropbox folder where uh, one of the folders is Lord British's canon, you know, things that absolutely you know, are not violatable, violatable rules, at least in, you know, presumptively anyway. And, uh, and n- number one or two on that list is you know, this game will have a cloth map. And uh, uh, and everybody's known that from the beginning. And even though we always assumed to be digital downloads, we were going to make a cloth map. Um, but uh, but it is interesting that uh, I did not foresee the drive or interest in the box itself. Uh, of course, now in hindsight, it seems obvious. But uh, uh, but it is odd. I agree that we didn't think that. Uh, and by the way, once you're shipping a cloth map, to put it in a box is a pretty easy thing. In fact, the, the cloth map is way more expensive. Than the box, so it's pretty easy for us to step up and say yes. We'll and we got to ship it in something. You know, you got to you got to put the cloth map in some kind of container. And so, uh, uh, getting a box done is uh, we're proud to now be offering it. Just curious about the, the cloth maps. And is there a company somewhere that you call and they're like, "Oh, it's it's Lord British again. He needs a new cloth map." I mean, you know, that's <laughs> I hilarious. Know. It, it turns out the answer to that question is no, but. Uh, it is hilarious that um, if you look at the first cloth maps we did, which was Ultima 2 through Sierra, um, we had a hard time finding any way that would make a cloth map. That was very difficult. And, uh, but the cloth map, our cost of goods, you know, is a few bucks and, uh, per cloth map. And then when we started Origin, we had to go find somebody else to make a cloth map. Those guys said, we're not doing it again. We're never doing those again. Those are such a hassle that, you know, they weren't, we didn't make any money on those maps, so forget it. So then we had to go find another source, and the price was basically the same. And then those people said they would never make those maps again either. So we had to go find a new third source. About the same cost, they won't make them again. And so uh, I don't think we're now anymore at the point of people will, won't make them a second time. And we now are finally this age where we've found two or three companies that will make them. But the price uh, you know, definitely hasn't gone down. Uh, you know, uh, no matter how many you order, p- people seem to really regret it because you know, it's, it's basically a... You know, uh, place setting uh, uh, cloth uh, of cloth, but in much smaller quantities than you might produce for Sears or somebody for, you know, place settings. Uh, so uh, it's kind of a hassle for people to any of these people who have the technology to make them, or even the nice printed manuals. They seem pretty rare nowadays. I'm excited about that. Yeah, no, me too. And um, uh, and the thing I like about them is uh, especially, and I think this is one of the things that, that Ultima Nine did, I think, particularly well. Which was that you know there's never an admittance that this is a computer game. You know the the fictional manuals are purely fictional manuals. They never say press Control A to make something happen. It's just all written as if it's true. And um, uh, and and I, and I'm a big believer that you know you you really want people to suspend your dis- the your their disbelief to play these games. And there's all kinds of things you can do to dr- dramatically enhance that. You know, I look at, you know, when I was doing research on virtues, for example, I happen to be a big fan of, of Buddhism. But, you know, Buddhism was something somebody wrote down as a way to think about life. Um, but, and, part, and the simplest parts of it, you know, the purpose of life is happiness. Love it. You know, uh, the reason why you might fail at happiness is because of personal suffering. Love that. You know, suffering's really in your mind. Love that, too. But pretty quickly, then it gets complex. You know, and there was the, the fourfold path and what each step means, you know, quickly gets quite complex and a little bit more difficult to defend as the truth of the universe with a capital T, um, even though I still admire, you know, um, you know, big sections of it. Uh, and another thing I found was that, you know, when you're creating fiction, when you're creating either magic systems or when you're creating virtue systems, how you frame them, how you keep it simple, how you make it appear to have a, you know, not just say good words, but have a pseudoscience behind it, mathematics and a rhythm to it that you can begin to predict and understand and repeat and remember. All those things are, are really important, I think, to making it a, a, a good system for a game, but also it sort of makes it even, even believable. It sort of makes it feel like, you know, it, it might actually really be true. Uh, if you keep these kind of these, these rules in mind, you can make something that's fictional feel as true or more true than what might actually be the truth, if you follow. Yeah, I do. I remember, uh, <laughs> you know, reading uh, the Dragonlance series and thinking, you know, that's it. the way they describe magic in there seems like maybe I should try to cast a magic missile, you know? <laughs> Why not? Uh, I got a lot of questions along these lines, uh, just about, you know, why did you go to Kickstarter? 
uh, yeah, for and, this project. And and I've heard that too. You know, a lot of people are saying like, hey, you know, here's a guy that took himself to space and all this kind of stuff. Why is he coming out to the general public? Uh, you know, so uh, first of all, I think a lot of people don't actually understand my personal finances, and not that I uh, think that's the not that I care to share them in detail. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, I've already uh, got millions of dollars into this project and this company, and I uh, the the, tr the absolute truth is that I either need to go to a large publisher to help not only finish it or and launch it, or I had to go to the public, and. Uh, uh, and as we considered those two options, I then kind of reflected on what I think my best successes of the past were and my, my, my most difficult uh, launches of the past. And uh, I think most people would agree, or at least I know I would assert, that Ultima 4, Ultima 7, and Ultima Online were the, my best works of uh, my early year, years. Uh, uh, and in all three of those products, I can tell you that my, even my own business partner brother much less our sales department, much less our parent company's sales department, did not understand those games, did not want those games, and was actually fighting against me in creating those visions. But I stood my ground and I made those games, and they're the ones I'm proudest of, and they're the ones that set the milestones of what think people think of an Ultima. It, on the other hand, if you look at the ones that had the most trouble, I would say it was Ultima 8 and Tabula Rasa. If you look at Ultimate and Tabula Rasa, I think Ultimate, the concept of Ultimate, I think was very solid, very good. But we ended up, we got a lot of pressure to ship it dramatically prematurely. And so we cut and cut and cut and cut until we fulfilled the sales department's demands. And, you know, the cloth map doesn't even match the gameplay, frankly. And there's tons of just plot threads that just end prematurely. And tons of the things, like jumping, for example, you know, are, were nightmarish from a player standpoint, but could have been done you know, uh, much more successfully, uh, or we would have changed it. Um, but since we, uh, you know, shipped it incorrectly, uh, you know, it, it's seen as a, as a weak link, or parts of it are seen as a weak link. And similarly, Tabula Rasa, you know, I, we, we restarted Tabula Rasa almost three times, uh, largely because the, our uh, publishers, our foreign publishers, you know, creatively weren't happy with where we were headed. And, um, uh, and finally we said, look, we've got to finish this game and ship something. And, um, uh, but at that point, you're, you're years out of position and uh, getting tons of pressure again to uh, you know, uh, make up for your failures, which you know, we're, we're listening to other people. And so, uh, uh, you know, so, so as I thought about those two options, again, I'm going, okay, well, I, I could go to another publisher, but I'd much rather be beholding to the players because the players are the ones who we're trying to serve uh, the players, the ones who know things like, uh, for example, one of the big mistakes we made in Ultima Online is that um, we failed to realize that, that we were sort of just the instigators of the product. The product really belonged to the players. And, of course, it became obvious once it was out and live, but it wasn't, we didn't realize that earlier in the process. And so we did tons of, of work on systems that no one ever knowed or cared about that we eventually ripped out, so it was just a waste of money. And we didn't work on some things that the players really loved, and we had to chase to uh, make worthy of the players' desires. And by in involving people early like this, early and often, it means we'll, we'll understand those mistakes before we make them, and we'll provide those uh, in real time. And I'm going to give you one precise example that happened since the Kickstarter began. So, I mean, a, a huge example has already come up, which is the ability to play permanently solo player. Um, you know that wasn't on my radar. I just assumed it'd be this little slider of you know how you know uh, I, I assumed you'd always be reconnecting to get the updates of the persistent world at the very least. I I could imagine that somebody wouldn't want to play such that every player's contribution of new blacksmith shops or other things wouldn't be seen by you. Uh, you know every every time you you uh, happen to be able to be connecting online. Um, but actually, there's not. There's a substantial number of players that say, look, I really want to. Just play completely offline. I don't want to see any changes anybody else makes in the whole world. So let me start and end solo player. And it was like, okay, well, our system actually handles that technically already pretty close. So sure, we'll give it to you. And so, uh, uh, but that's something I would never have guessed had we not already had the level of player dialogue we have right now through the Kickstarter. Uh, and it's not that I haven't had the chance to talk to people on you know, Facebook or our own websites or G plus uh, other places where I'm always act I've been you know for the last year I've been actively talking about this game and trying to decide on a lot of these features. But until you've put this up there in the big way we have now, um, and have people who've said, 
I'm not going to give you my 50 bucks until you do this. And you go, okay, well, if, if it really means there's a thousand people who are going to give you 50 bucks or not, I better think about it pretty carefully. And uh, so, you know, we plan it, we get it in there, and then people commit. So, um, uh, so the Kickstarter process has already been very healthy uh, for this game. Is it going to have rats in it? <laughs> uh, do you mean, do you, if, if by rats you mean that at the beginning of the game you'll be given a club or a stick and a bunch <laughs> of rats that you'll go bonk on the head and until you're finally strong enough to pick up a sword and then maybe you'll pick, up, pick on dogs or wolves instead? Absolutely not. Um, if you mean rats in the sense of it might be fun artistically to have a, a grain silo that's infested with rats, we yeah, never know. We might put some rats in the game of that side. Okay. But, uh, uh, but we're, we're definitely trying to avoid... The uh, well, the level. I mean, that that's part of the level grind. That's part of the classic level grind. And uh, I don't think there's any point in um, uh, in making you feel that way. Um, you know, while uh, while we definitely have a game where you'll earn experience points, and that experience uh, will let you invest in uh, knowledge, you know, which you might call skills uh, that you play with. Uh, we're we're not setting up a world where you know you're fenced in by level one monsters, then you're fenced in by level two monsters, then fenced in by level three monsters. Um, uh, it's much more open than that. I have a couple questions here from Jay Barnson from Tales of the Rampant Coyote. Great. Uh, first, besides the, the leveling treadmill, which we kind of talked about, uh, what other aspects of modern RPG slash MMOs are you trying to replace, reinvent, or improve upon with Shroud of the Avatar? Well, I would say the other one, I touched on this one a little bit too, but I'll see if I can find another angle on it as well, but, uh, which is the uh, quest logs. I'm, I'm really I'm wanting to get rid of quest logs in favor of actual exploration and discovery. Um, uh, you know, to my mind, the, the worst example is exclamation over your head, talk to them, you know, type all the, you know, click on all the menu options, highlight the thing you want to do in a quest log, arrow on the ground, takes you to your destination. That's the worst and, um, uh, you know, it, it just means you're literally blindly running where it tells you. you. You don't even bother to follow the nooks and the crannies of the mountain ranges uh, to see what's behind them. Because unless you've got an arrow sending you there, you kind of de by default know that it's not relevant. And so... Um, uh, you could train a monkey to do that kind of thing. Literally. You could macro that probably. <laughs> you know, put a screen capture on there to look for the color of the arrow and... Uh, you know, automatically uh, hold that key down. So, uh, uh, yeah, so we're trying to get rid of... We're, that's, that's one of the major issues we're trying to get away from. And, uh, but, but, but exactly where, how far we get away from it and how much manual work we put on part of the player, we're trying to make sure you don't necessarily have to pull out a pencil and paper. Um, we're not trying to push quite that far. But, um, but I'm definitely trying to, you know, do something that is uh, close enough to that to where, you know, you... you Feel like I'm I'm having, having I'm actually having to pay attention and uh, and think about what do I want to do next other than the, just the next item down on the quest log. So here's Jay's second question. So aside from the knowledge that publishers will try to screw you over, uh, what other lessons are you bringing over from your experiences with Origin, EA, Destination Games, and NC Soft uh, that you can apply at the Portalarium? Um, well, you know what's interesting is uh, uh, so while I while I of course have a great empathy for the way that that was phrased uh, about the relationship to other publishers, it is interesting to let, let me at least give you a slight mitigating uh, a less evil interpretation of the other publishers. Um, uh, you know, everyone has their own experiences as to what does or does not work. And usually, as I've looked back at the mistakes I've made of listening to some advice or pressure of uh, new business partners, uh, it's because we failed to consider the differences between our goals and strategies. You know, for example, when uh, when Origin became part of Electronic Arts, Electronic Arts' perennial best-selling uh, software of any kind was always at sports products. And the way they would develop the sports products is every year, uh, I mean, they sort of had an engine that was in permanent ongoing development. They call it the Madden you know, tools. And they, they would stop enough ahead of the, the, the beginning of football season to package it up and launch something at the beginning of football season, knowing that if they thought of any other great whiz-bang special effects, they'll just put it in the next season. Because every year, just before the beginning of football season, they've got the next Madden out. And, uh, and for a sports title, 
That's great. It's the perfect rhythm. It clearly makes sense from a marketing standpoint. Obviously, it works. And it also means, they're, since they're always developing the tools, they're always right on the cutting edge. So when we joined forces with EA, they were like, I'm like, look, Richard, we can tell you, we've tried shipping things on these specific dates, like before Christmas or not. And we can, you know, their advice was, they said, look, you get out of this rhythm. If you miss Christmas with, say, Ultima 8, um, you know, we can tell you that your lifetime sales will go down much more due to missing that date than for, by you cutting out some of the features or other things that you can put in the next game. And so there was a, you know, and... And you know, and, and they just paid me a bunch of money to buy my company, so it's kind of hard not to say, you know, hey, go jump. I'm going to do something else instead. And their logic was sound, and they had, um, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, it, it was, it was, it really wasn't evil. It was, uh, it was just uh, wrong, and um, uh, wrong for me, wrong for Ultima. And um, uh, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and uh, I can blame myself as much as I blame them. Um, but those pressures will continue to exist. And so, uh, uh, you know, if if I ever work with another publisher again, and I, I would predict that sometime in the future, you know, uh, it, it would be likely that uh, you know, another publisher will become a partner at you know sometime in the uh, at some point in time, you know, in, in the great arc of the future. Um, but you know, I think uh, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, beat me once or you know hurt me once, uh, shame on me. Second time, shame on you, but now I've already done it twice. So, uh, you know, I, I, hopefully I won't have to do that a third time. Hopefully I won't uh, fall prey to that same problem a third time, even if it were to uh, occur. Here's a question from Cody. Cody, or I'm going to rephrase this a little bit. So basically what he's concerned, I guess he saw the videos and the prototypes, and he's a little concerned that it might be too difficult. Uh, who is sort of the idea? Well, he says uh, it might be a little difficult for us older RPGers. I'm not quite sure what, he, what he's saying here. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, in your opinion, who is the ideal uh, player for this game? And, and will it be difficult in, in any sense? Um, here's why I don't think so. Um, I, you know, I think that one of the... There have been some great uh, innovations in gameplay. You know, I described, you know, the things I think have gone too far, gone awry about quest logs and errors on screen. That's where things have gone badly. But there's another place where I think a lot of RPGs make a lot of mistakes, even though they don't need to, because there's been plenty of invention that have shown other solutions. Um, and here, the mistake, the, the second mistake of especially MMOs is the is the following. You know, most MMOs, you boot up the game, you watch a little intro, you go, okay, there, I've been introduced to the bad guy, I'm told I'm the hero. Uh, next thing you have to do is decide what class and race you're going to be. Well, these are permanent decisions you have to make before you've actually seen the game at all. And of course you have a bit general idea about what a fighter is compared to a cleric. You know, am I going to fight or am I going to heal? You, you get the general gist. But you actually don't know with how they've been implemented. You don't know if you like the systems of either one of those two things since you're being asked to make that permanent decision up front before you ever play. So you, you research it a little bit or you read all the text, you make those decisions. Now you're told to craft your avatar. And a lot of them give you the ability to put your eyebrows in exactly the right place and your eye color and the shape of your eye and the shape of your face and how much hair. And you're going, I'm not, I may not be able to make this decision again. They don't tell you if you will or won't usually. So you bother to take the time to get your character just right to be whatever character of yourself you like. And now you get dropped in the game. And by the way, just those first two steps might have taken you an hour. 30 minutes at least, often up to an hour. An hour just for the eyebrows. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Now you're dropped into the town, and you look around, and a lot of these games are beautiful. You know, people put hundreds of millions of dollars into just the beauty of these mostly not interactive worlds. And, um, uh, and as you look around, usually start in a town, you see a handful of people with exclamation points over their head. You see the weapon shop, the magic shop, uh, you know, with a couple other tool shops. Um, and outside the fence at the edge of town, you see the level one rats, you know, waiting for you to come kill them. And so then you spend, you know, another 30 minutes wandering around through the town, getting all leather armor or whatever you can, the few things you can afford, and uh, getting those first couple of missions, which are to go mine some rats. And, uh, and then finally you walk out and mine yourself some rats. And now, by the time you've done that, you've literally spent two or three hours in this game to realize this is the same as every other piece of crap that's been shipped in the last few years in the MMO space. And, uh, and, and, and so my tolerance to even start another MMO that gives me any indication it's going to have those set of features is zero. 
I mean, I I'm, I look at it, and, and and the free to play ones are the worst. I mean, it's almost inevitable that those are the ones that are gonna you know throw throw you in the in in that way. Uh, I'm a big believer that a, a game like a movie needs to sell itself to you in the first five minutes at most. Two minutes would be a bit better. And that means you have to refine your user interface and the presentation of those first few moments to a way where I can actually physically operate it and see what it's going to be like to be that fighter and or that cleric within two minutes. And so you've got to tell me why this game is great in two minutes. And that, and that has to include that I both understand it and I can use it. And, uh, and while that's a big challenge, uh, I think that's what a lot of uh, modern games are doing it. Not necessarily all the role-playing games, although some. And, uh, uh, but a lot of uh, um, even what I, you know, the, I'll, I'll use the, e, the dreaded word, you know, mobile or social games, have worked really hard at refining that skill of just saying, let me not demand of you a bunch before you get started, just so you get to understand the game up front. Then I'll demand more of you later. And so I think there are lessons even from all kinds of other walks of life, shall we say, uh, that can be applied back now into gaming. But I would even argue, uh, you know, in Ultima 9, uh, which was you know, still 12 years old, uh, we, did, we did a pretty good job of letting you, you know, you started in a house, you wake up out of bed, you learn how to turn on and off light switches, you, you find each piece of your user interface. It's, you know, I, I thought it was a pretty pleasant way to unfold the complexity of the game to you, uh, you know, early on. All right, this is just a quick question from uh, Jack Day. So would you consider plans for a console-based release? You know, it's interesting. Um, I am very much a proud PC developer. And that's for a variety of reasons that have been reinforced down through the years. First, it was a very practical reason. That's because that's the only machine I had and the machine I like to play on, etc. Then, then it became my rationalization became the fact that it has a keyboard and a mouse. And at least for, you know, in my mind, if there's two kinds of gameplay. There's gameplay that where, like you and I are right now, we are sitting right in front of the screen. I can touch my screen. We're this close to it because the experience you and I are having right now is on the other side of the screen. We're talking to each other through these screens. Then there are games where, like Parappa the Rappa, my, my favorite console game, um, where the experience is on with everybody on the same side of the screen. It's, uh, it, the screen is not the portal to the other people. It, the people sitting in the living room all saying that screen at the same time are the experience. And so it needs to be a console game, in my mind. Um, uh, that was part two. But then there's another one that has come up down through the years, which is that if I had ever devoted myself to one console or another, my audience would not be continuous. Um, you know, a lot of consoles have been picked up or abandoned by a variety of gamers down through time in a way that PC gamers have had a sort of a continuity. And, uh, and so I'm not sure I could have had the same duration of success had I been on consoles. So that's my, that's my pro PC comment. However, um, we're now developing in the Unity engine. And one of the nice things about that engine is how trivial it is to recompile for basically every platform. And uh, and so even though right now we we you know, as we've been trying to be very open and above board about we're creating a PC game first, it's going to be very easy for us to make a Mac and even a Linux you know version at the same time. That those just are almost not exactly but close to freebies. Um, and at the moment we can recompile onto tablets just because the game's not yet so big that it won't fit on a tablet. And uh, and since a lot of I do a lot of my gaming on tablets just because when I travel it's convenient. So I'm hopeful that our game will actually work on tablets. And if there is demand on a console, we actually, again, that, that is much more within our immediate reach than it ever has been in the past. And so uh, while today I, wouldn't, uh, I would not say I have plans for a console version, um, but it's not difficult. And since it's not difficult, you know, if we get the game done and the game's going well and there is a demand for it on consoles, it's definitely something we could consider. Here's a question from Ben Leggett. How do you feel about the path of that MMOs have taken post Ultima Online? Uh, do you wish they'd built more on that model than the EverQuest model? Uh, yeah, I think almost every MMO has been built on the EverQuest model. Um, and so I think that's quite an accurate uh, observation. And uh, so on the one hand, as a player, yes, I wish that more were built on the UO model by all means. 
as a developer, I'm kind of glad nobody else has gone after the UO model because it leaves me room to go after the UO model. And so, um, uh, so, uh, so, so I have mixed, uh, mixed feelings on the subject. But I also understand why a lot of people haven't, by the way. You know, making Ultimas, whether it's the story type Ultimas that have not only these deep, rich stories just as a narrative, but especially once you add in the virtue systems and the behind the scenes monitoring of player behavior, that is really hard to do. And so uh, a lot of people don't do it, I think, because it's really hard and the market doesn't necessarily reward it, it, it commensurate with its additional difficulty, if you know what I mean. Um, and uh, similarly with MMOs, you know, you look at, um, you know, for example, uh, my last company, NCSoft, you know, their, their most successful title was uh, Lineage. And if you look at Lineage, screenshot for screenshot, far more beautiful than anything that I had ever produced. You know, you, you would look at the tile graphic world compared to, say, Ultima that was developed at a similar period of time. Theirs is way more beautiful, but not a stitch of it is interactive. The only thing you can do in that game is kill monsters and resupply. Um, you know, you would see these chests and barrels and cups and plates and vending stands and all the stuff all over the place. Not a pixel was interactive. And, and for me, I'd walk around going like, uh, why, I'm, I'm clicking on this thing. Why, why isn't it happening? Why isn't it working? And, uh, and again, the answer is because it's hard. You know, it's, if, you, if, you've got a, if you've got a big bank of artists, you can, come, you know, you can make beautiful art you know, till, like, till you run out of money. But, uh, but if you want to make every one of those interactive and then weave them into all the other interactive objects and make those all part of the deeper story and, and relevant, that's a lot more work. And, um, and again, I'm not saying I'm the only one who does hard work. Those guys work hard too. But, uh, but again, I think the type of hard work that makes a good Ultima of the past and makes what I hope to make sure that I keep uh, doing in my work in the future is, is hard work that I think that me and my team are uniquely qualified to do, uh, that the market that, that the market as judged by, you know, players of World of Warcraft, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily w reward as well, but it's what I like to do. It's what I like to play. And, um, and I believe, uh, there's enough other people out there that like that route too, that we'll go do this together. It really sounds what you're saying is that you prefer substance over style. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, and I'd love to have style in there too, of course. And I hope we, we get plenty of style in there by all means. And there's other things like, uh, you know, if I look at, uh, you know, other things that I think Worlds of Warcraft, for example, does extremely well, you know, their art direction, number one, you know, they, they have a really consistent, excellent, uh, you know, art direction across an entire series. Another thing they do uh, way better than I've ever done is the fine tuning of the balance of the challenge and reward cycle. You know, there, even though I'm not a big fan of the level fence kind of blocking you, blockading you as you uh, go up and up and up over time, you know, they've got that, you know, how hard is it before you'll give up and maybe sure I give you a reward just before you give up and now you're only just barely strong enough to struggle against the next hurdle and, and then just before you give up, I'll finally give you another piece of cheese. Um, you know, th they do that really, really well. I mean, it's, it's a science that they have mastered probably better than any other company. And, uh, and so I admire what they do, and there are lessons I hope I learn from what they do um, to improve even the offerings that I put forth. Uh, but, uh, but it's not the fundamental. It's not, it doesn't make the top of my to-do list. Uh, I, I expect I'll still be less good at that than them in my uh, next games. Uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, I have very few challengers to uh, what makes the essence of an Ultima of the storylines, virtue systems, rich detailed world, uh, and non-combat roles that allow you to live out a full life. All right, so <clears throat> Richard, I have only one last question about the Kickstarter here. So just imagine this. So imagine you're the guy with the fifty bucks, and you're looking at this thing, and you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. You know, what what would you need to hear before you just say, okay, uh, I'm in? Well, you know, it's uh, uh, I would I, well, of course, any, anything I can think of that matches that, of course, we're putting it in. So, uh, uh, so really, I want to hear from other people to know that because I need to get people to you know not just uh, come along for the ride, but come along deeply, you know, for the ride, or at least a lot of people. So whether it's help me bring more people or help me uh, upsell y'all to you know come in uh, at higher levels, uh, you know, I really do think it's it's uh, the, the combination that we've tried to at least assert is that from a software standpoint. We're going to be the best of what really it took to create Ultima 4, Ultima 7, Ultima Online, and this new interpretation. Just like I, I helped invent role-playing, I helped invent massively multiplayer role-playing, and I think we have a new invention of multiplayer role-playing 
that is uh, that I think is the, really the future of what you might have previously considered MMOs. Uh, combine that with the fact that we are going to do those tangible goods, cloth maps, boxes, manuals, trinkets, the whole bit. I personally think that um, you know you you get those two things together, uh, those two aspects of the software and the physical goods, and um, you know few people know how to do that as well as we do, and come along for the ride. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you'd like to pledge to the Shroud of the Avatar Kickstarter, you're probably going to want to come in at $125. That way you get the box, the cloth map, and all the cool stuff. But of course, you can uh, pledge as much or as little as you'd like. Uh, at any rate, I hope that you'll support it. I will put the link to the Kickstarter page in the show notes, or you can just uh, look for it on Google or Kickstarter. It's pretty uh, easy to find. And like I said, he has reached his minimum funding goal, uh, but there's still plenty of exciting stretch goals left and plus I think you guys are going to want to get in on this it's going to be a part of a CRPG history if you will as always, I want to thank everyone who has donated and supported this show. It really means a lot to me, guys. If you would like to support Matt Chat, just go to armchairarcade.com. Look for the link in the top right corner of the page and set it and forget it. Uh, you can set up a dollar a month subscription. You won't even notice that, but it will make a difference to me. Now, what about that ale of the week? So for the ale of the week, I've got a... A stone selection here. This is Old Guardian barley wine style ale. Now, I wasn't even aware that Stone had, had had has a barley wine line. That's one of my favorite styles. So I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, these guys are out of San Diego, California. I think I've had maybe their Arrogant Bastard on before. A really good choice there too. 11.6% uh, alcohol, so you know definitely up there. Uh, there's a huge write-up on the back of this bottle, and, but uh, strangely, it doesn't seem to have much to do with the actual ale in question. It said it's a story about uh, a guy named Greg's travels around uh, South America, as far as I can tell. So not really sure what that has to do with anything. Uh, maybe he had a little too much of this barley wine <laughs> before he, uh, oh, as he was writing up the bottle text. But anyway, let, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got this old guardian in the rather excellent drinking horn here. And been smelling this, and it smells quite nice. Uh, you can definitely smell the hops. You can tell this is going to be very flavorful. <sighs> Not a lot going on there besides the hops. Maybe a little hint of a dandelion uh, type aroma. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's give this a taste. I want to toast to uh, David Swafford, the uh, Director of Communications at Portalarium. Uh, David contacted me over at Armchair Arcade and set this interview up. I've been trying for years, literally, uh, to interview Richard Garriott, and he made it happen in just a few minutes. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much, David. It was really exciting to get to finally meet Lord British. Uh, so here's to you. Uh, uh. <laughs> Oh, subtle, this ain't. Uh, a really strong uh, tasting ale. Oh, it's kind of a bitter, uh, dark, chocolatey, coffee kind of flavor. Really bitter aftertaste here. Um, the alcohol is uh, very po uh, potent as well. 11.2, tastes more like 16, 17% to me. It's funny that you don't smell any of it, but you definitely taste it. Uh, yeah, just kind of dark, uh, thick, syrupy, kind of what you expect from an IPA, uh, maybe a stout. Uh, not really what I would expect from a barley wine at all. Uh, that said, it's not bad. It's definitely something uh, interesting to try. Uh, I'm going to go uh, two out of five drinking horns on this, uh, mostly because it's uh, it tastes fine, but it's just not what I would expect from a barley wine. Uh, you know, if you've uh, tried the Sierra uh, Nevada barley wine style, for example, uh, that's kind of what I what I'm looking for here, and I'm just getting something more like an IPA or a stout. So, anyway, two out of five drinking horns seems to uh, be good for that. Now, for the quotation this week, I've actually got a poem I'm going to uh, read to you uh, by J.R.R. Tolkien, and tell me if this isn't just perfect uh, for the occasion. So, I'll uh, be right back with this poem. All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wonder are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. 
deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall be woken, a light from the shadows shall spring. Renewed will be the sword that was broken, and the crownless again shall be king. See you guys next week. Uh, it really will shoot these, you know, quite hazardous for children, right. uh, you know, kind of toys And go here. right into your eye, and then you'll be sorry. Yeah, but I have... Oh, and this, oh my gosh. Oh yeah, he has a little mace. Oh, look at this mace. A little mace. Those, yeah, I, those, are, those I don't like. Yeah, that would, that would hurt uh, that if it was would. real sized. Right.